Hello students, you all are warmly welcome to our YouTube channel, Chemistry Teacher. Here, it's we are going to present you another lesson. It's standing for a discovery of a subatomic particle. Students, in our earlier videos also, we talked about, we found out such two discoveries of two subatomic particles. Subatomic particles, what are the subatomic particles? Ah, those are electrons, protons, neutrons, what we have got in our syllabus to follow. Students, out of those, it's we looked at the discovery of electron and proton, so it remains the neutron, right? So, it's what we are going to do. It's we are going to discover the neutron here in this video, within this video, during this video. Students, when we talk about those subatomic particles, those come in the order of electron, proton, neutron. So, it's the same when you check history. It's the same. They are ordered, they were discovered. So, it's first electron, then after proton, then after its neutron. Students, it was in year 1896, it was J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. Then, it was 1970, Ernest Rutherford discovered the proton, the second subatomic particle. Then, it has to be after Rutherford, right? This discovery name, the neutron. Yes, it is. For the reason, this particle, neutron, was neutral in charge. So, there was no evidence at the beginning. There was no instinct. There was no such a, a way that they could find it out there. So, there were, therefore, it was quite late when they discovered the neutron. It was in 1932 by James Chadwick. James Chadwick made that discovery. So, it's what we are going to talk here about. Students, when you check for the background, it's, we could find these few things. It's you have, within atom you have electrons, protons, neutrons. It's, we already know, you have neutrons and protons inside the nucleus and electrons around that. So, then, protons have positive charges, electrons have negative charges, and neutrons have no charges. It's, we already know those things, those points. Students, it was in year 1911, Ernest Rutherford revealed the existence of nucleus using the experimental results done by Guy Dan Master under his own supervision. So, it's the gold foil experiment. So, analyzing the results of gold foil experiment, Ernest Rutherford revealed there is a nucleus inside an atom. So, it carries all the positive charges and the mass of the atom. That was very, very important when we talk about this. Students, it after two years later, means 1913 around, it was Henry D.J. Mosley, another scientist, he was a bright fellow. So, he found out a method to reveal the charge of the nucleus, means the positive charge of the nucleus. At that time, it was just the charge of the nucleus, but it we know the charge of the nucleus is determined by protons. So, after him, it was in year 1917, Rutherford revealed that there are protons. So, but before that, it was uh, Henry J.J. Mosley revealed ah, this number of charges, this number of charges you have, they are in the nucleus. So, finding out the charge of the nucleus of hydrogen. So, he showed that others are having multiples. The charges of others are multiples of this. Therefore, it was just the relative charge. Then he gave the relative charge of hydrogen as the value stack stood for relative charge of hydrogen as 1. Then all the other atoms were uh, the multiples of that. Those were complete number integers right, stood for other atoms nuclear charge. So he revealed a method to find out the nuclear charge. That means the number of protons for us today. 
means the atomic number object. After revealing the atomic number, okay, then after they know how many protons they are within that atom you could find out. So afterward, they could find out the masses of atoms. Actually, it was after NW Aston. Aston, he invented an instrument, he built an instrument to find out the masses of those particles, small particles, atoms. Then after students, they could find out, they could know what are the masses of these atoms. When they compare that with the number of protons in a way like, they could find out that hydrogen was carrying one proton. Then they could find out the mass of hydrogen atom. They could find out the masses of other atoms as well. Then they could find out the number of protons in those atoms as well. It, it is very, very important. Students, when you know the mass of one proton, having hydrogen there, mass of one proton, and when you multiply mass of one proton by the total number of protons you have within the atom, it's what you get is the mass of all the protons there are within the atoms. If protons only are contributing to the mass, so mass of an electron is negligible compared to a proton, it is compared to a proton, the mass of an electron, 1836 times, let's say 4 times. So, it does not significantly contribute to the mass, determining the mass of an atom. Therefore, then knowing the total number of protons there are in an atom, knowing the mass of one proton, having the to uh, mass of all the protons there are in the atom, seeing the mass of the atom is not exactly that. It's actually quadratic half. Means when it was found out the mass of an atom, it appeared like half. The mass of all the protons there are within the atom is just the half value of the mass that you have there. Then they felt like they smelled like ah, oh, therefore you need to have another particle within the atom, but it should not contribute to the charge but the mass only. So they felt like that. That was the background. That was the background. It made them, it led them to discover the neutron. Okay, it was uh, James Chadwick did that. James Chadwick discovered the neutron. But students, it we before talking about that Chadwick's experiment, we are going to take a look at how they would manage to get the masses of those small particles. Ah, its students, as I have already told, it was F.W. Aston. After built that mass spectrograph or mass spectrometer. So let me show you the rough sketch of his instrument. Students, if we talk about this mass spectrograph or mass spectrometer, it's you will find it being something like this. There you have a chamber here. It's another one. I will explain this all. So these are electromagnets you have got. So this is the instrument we talk about. Let's say you want to find out the mass of a sample. Means a mass of an element. So if you have a sample of that element, it has to be in its pure form. So if you feed that sample inside the instrument, where ah, you need to feed it here. This place, this part of the instrument is called the evaporation chamber. Ah, it's the evaporation chamber. Why it is called evaporation chamber? It made that sample evaporate. Providing heat with a coil, it evaporates the sample. Even. So it turns into a vapor there. Then students, there would be an entrance, small. So those particles evaporated would go out there, means would enter the other chamber. Within that chamber, if you have an 
electric gun means it's a high speed electric beam going to strike against this wave a high speed electron beam if you have an electron gun so let's say minus plus a uh, high voltage difference you have by there so then by striking with those electrons high speed electrons what would happen is those atoms let's say you have got uh, any atom like uh, sodium you have got after striking by those high speed electron sodium is having the protons and level electrons so the outermost is electrons so after striking by electrons those would lose either one or more electrons by the atom so that would then get transformed into na plus whatever it is the type of the element let's say it is oxygen or plus it is lithium li plus if it is uh, iron fp plus whatever the type of the atoms regardless with the fact that whether it's a uh, metal or non metal so it would be transformed into its positively charged species therefore what would you get here would be plus positively charged species mostly we would assume that its uh, one electron could be removed for the very first time then students next to that if you would have another Uh, metal sheet there. So before going there, I will name this as the ionization chain. Ionization, uh, ionization the process there. So the chamber would be called ionization chamber. Students, then you have two metal sheets there, applying a high voltage. So here it's a negative charge. It's a positive charge you have got. So then, what would happen next is these positively charged particles form would be attracted by this metal sheet with negative uh, end. So it's negatively charged. So those would spot on the metal sheet. When you have a hole made, a slit made, some particles which come straight to the slit would go through that and appear at the other side. But here also, if you have facing that another slit, that positively charged particle would enter there and go there. So having this positive charge of the slide here of this metal sheet, then this metal sheet would repel that particle. So that's a positively charged particle. So that particle would be accelerated. Ah, therefore we would call this electric field as the accelerating electric field students then this particle would start moving fast would be accelerated then these are electromagnets you have when a charged particle here a positively charged particle is going through a magnetic field there would be an imbalance force inserted by the magnetic field on that perpendicular to its passing direction there would be an imbalance force working applied by the magnetic field so when it is the positively charged particle is going there it we could call it a current passing so then you have a magnetic field held perpendicular to its traveling direction using fleming's left hand rule it's you could find out the direction direction of that charged particle is going so students it would get deflected as to take a bend then take it would take a bend and spot here ah then what would happen is you are using electromagnets electromagnetic field to provide a magnet insert a magnetic field in up as to bend this deflect this as to spot this on this it's a membrane it could detect when the charged particle spot so then it would result a signal student then after after detection of that signal it would be amplified this amplified signal then would be transformed into its by let's say its by a computer would be transformed into a readable graph that's what we 
A identified as the mass spectrum. So then there would be an intensity, let's call it the abundance or abundance. Then here it's the relative mass. You get the act in the graph. So there would be a P given. Then that's what you get standing for one specific element. Again, X, you need to fit your sample there inside the evaporation chamber. It will be your operator. It will then send to the ionization chamber. It will be ionized by this electron beam. So then after it's after losing electrons, it will be positively charged. That positively charged particles will be attracted by this electric field. And it will be further accelerated by the electric field. Then after students, it would go through a magnetic field, it would get deflected by the magnetic field and spot there on a membrane and result a signal. That signal would be amplified, then would be transformed into a readable signal or readable uh, graph. So that's what we call a mass spectrum. Then it could deflect slightly or it could get deflect more. So this deflection, this deflection is dependent on the magnetic field strength. Ah, it's an electromagnetic field. You could, you could change, you could control the magnetic field strength accordingly. Then regarding this particle, if its charge is greater, the deflection would be greater. If its mass is greater, the deflection would be less. Students, this deflection is dependent on the charge over mass ratio of that particle. So, if we assume that at most of the time, if those particles lose one electron, then it's a unipositive species you get, plus one charge species. Therefore, the charge we could assume as the same. Then, it, this deflection is dependent on mass. If it is more than mass, the required magnetic field to uh, bend that on the uh, detector would be greater. If it is like the mass, it's not that high, that strong magnetic field to be applied to deflect that. Students, accordingly, you would get relative mass. You could get an idea about the relative mass. So, then, using this instrument, it's, you could find out the relative mass of that specific particle. Let's say it's an atom. Ah, it's the relative atomic mass you could find out there. Then, students, for some sample, with some elements, it's giving more than one peak close by. Then what does it say? It's for the reason you have two different particles or two different atoms with different masses. If the atomic number is the same, the number of photons will be the same. So the reason you get two different particles or two different masses is just because they are having different number of neutrons. But it's at the time of Aston, it was not revealed as those were neutrons. Anyway, then it led them to reveal isotopes. Ah, it's within the same element. You could find out atoms having different masses. Those are called isotopes. It's now we know it's for the reason they have a different number of neutrons. So then students, it's using this Aston's spectrometer or spectrograph it's we would reveal these things we could find out the relative atomic mass if it is one p given if it is more than one p given it's we could find out the number of isotopes they are within that sample you have if it is three peaks given three isotopes two peaks given two isotopes so then it's the height of the p is dependent on the particles received. They are for the abundance of that particle. So then this height you would find out, you would measure. Then adding all the heights together, you could get the total height. 
dividing each height by the total height you would get the relative abundance percentage of that specific isotope found within that sample ah then it's not only the number of isotopes you are having it's uh, you would find out relative mass of each isotope as well as relative abundance of those isotopes then using such information you could finally find when you have isotopes as well you would finally find the relative atomic mass of that species okay so let me give you a rough idea how to find out the relative atomic mass of such a species when you have more than one type means when you have isotopes let's assume that for a sample of chlorine if you are having a peak there at when it is 35 the relative isotopic mass or relative mass let's say then when it is 37 when it is 37 then students it you get two isotopes of chlorine they say it's chlorine for this example so if you find the height of this beam as let's say just just roughly i'm giving just the idea 3 cm height and it is 1 cm height so it's all together 4 cm the height so then it is chlorine 35 chlorine chlorine it's 35 mass number no atomic number is 70 chlorine 70 35 is having 3 over 4 into 100 the percentage is the abundance the percentage of that isotope the other isotope is 70 37 and it's having 1 over 4 into 100 Is seventy five here? Here it's twenty five percent. Those are the relative abundances. Then, students, you could find out relative atomic mass of chlorine. It's this sample. It's with thirty five. You have seventy five percent of that. Then it's thirty seven. That mass number means the uh, relative mass. Then you have twenty five percent out of that. When you add them up, it you get the relative atomic mass of chlorine. Okay, so that's what we call the mass spectrometer and mass spectrum. So using analyzing a mass spectrum, it you could reveal the relative mass, relative isotopic mass, relative mass of each isotope. If you have isotopes. and number of isotopes you are having and the abundance of each isotope and finally the relative atomic mass of those isotopes okay students i guess that is enough about these information regarding how to measure the masses using astons mass spectrograph then let's go to our topic our topic is the discovery of neutron right okay if we have finally come to the point to the point means is the discovery of neutron made by james chandy he did an experiment so in his experiment he was using a radioactive source emitting alpha radiations students alpha radiations as we already know are positively charged then he used a detector of those radiations when positively charged or let's say any charged particles are received the detector here is giving a reading so that's the detector he was using such a detector there then let me show you his experimental setup made students this is the radioactive source and it is stored in a lead tube as we already know it's just to avoid the leakage of all those radiation harmful all around so then it is giving a beam of alpha radiation they are so as i have told you there is a detector as to detect charged particles then 
when you are having charged particles, when there are charged particles there, there is a reading given by the detector. Okay, so then showing that uh, there are alpha radiations with positive charge, there are also reading given. That's the first observation. Then students, it's to the same setup at the next time. It was a beryllium sheet. A beryllium sheet was kept there between the detector and the radioactive source. Then what happened? What there was on the detector could be seen. There was no reading given. So you could assume that ah, it's due to no charged particle receiving or having there, reach there. So that's that's it. Anyway, that's the conclusion we could make. Then there was a beryllium sheet brought in front of the radioactive source to block, let's assume that to block alpha radiations. These are alpha radiations having a positive charge in them. So then there was no reading seen. But students next to the same setup when at the next time still having the beryllium sheet there to the same setup having the instrument which could detect charged particles when there was a paraffin wax layer, paraffin wax layer brought paraffin or any hydrocarbon layer brought between them means the instrument that detector so and the beryllium sheet. Then students it gave a reading again. It gave a reading again. How could it be possible? It's just because for the reason some charged particles received reached there. So then analyzing these experimental observations made, then it was James Chadwick explained that nicely. He told that when alpha rays were there, means reached there, then those were charged, that's why the reading given. He told that when the beryllium sheet was beaten with alpha radiation or when you spot alpha radiations on the what? Beryllium sheet. So anyway, beryllium's atomic number is 4 and its mass number is 9. Students, its, it's atomic number, number of protons there is 2, the mass number is 4 of alpha radiation is 2 protons, 2 neutrons you have there. Then students, after spotting alpha rays on the beryllium sheet, it's a nuclear reaction happening. So, it did transform into carbon. Carbon means carbon 6 to L. The atomic number is 6. We would accept that. It's uh, you have 4 plus 2 being 6 there. Then it's uh, 9 plus 4 is 13, but it's 12. You have 1. They are mass number unit. So it's a uh, he was saying there was a neutral particle, neutral particle having no protons, no atomic number. Ah, this is what it happens. So then after spotting those alpha radiation on the beryllium sheet, neutrons get emitted. But receiving neutrons, this does not give any reading for the reason those are not charged. Those are not charged. Then students, it's after bringing a paraffin wax layer. So with the energy of these uh, neutrons, these are neutrons now. So with the energy of those neutrons, these lose protons, H plus. So those protons go there and result protons 
H plus are positively charged, those results are reading again. So he explained that, James Chadwick explained that you have neutral particles with. So X with the idea in the sense of neutral was named as neutron. Okay, that's the discovery of neutron made. Okay, again, students, when alpha rays spot on the beryllium sheet, it forms neutrons, it removes, it loses, it ejects neutrons from that. So, then these neutrons cause this hydrocarbon or packing wax layer to lose hydrogen ions. So, those hydrogen ions reaching here result a reading again. So, then he explain that there are neutral particles as well within atoms. So those were named as neutrons. Okay, that's the discovery of neutron. Students, now we know there are three subatomic particles. What are those? Those are electron, proton, neutron. So if we compare their properties of those three subatomic particles, electron, proton, neutron. So, the symbol you use normally is simple E, simple P, and simple N. Then, when we take the relative charge, relative charge, is the charge with respect to let's say one proton if we take this as one then this is minus one this has no charge then when we take the charge students if the same the size 1.602 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb 1.602 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb the size there is no charge but if you denote this by positive to say it's opposite, let's say it's minus. Okay, then the relative mass. Relative mass. So it's if we take this as one, this also would be one. Then this would take one over thousand eight hundred and thirty-six. The relative mass. Then students, the mass, mass. Then, when you take the true mass, it would be 9.106 into 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. So, it's here, it would be like 1.67, it is 26 into 10 to the power minus 27 kilogram. It is 1.6749 around into 10 to the power minus 30. Uh, minus 27, 27 kilograms still. So they have close masses but neutrons are quite greater in mass than protons. Then when you check for the positions they are, you would find that how it's uh, within the nucleus of an atom, you find protons and neutrons there. Then uh, electrons are there around the nucleus in the field of an atom they are would be in energy levels let's find it out later on so then those are the stuff regarding those uh, subatomic particles then students together those protons and neutrons they are if we call them uh, except electrons they are if we call them nucleons ah, the nucleus when you uh, state the nucleus, the particles within the nucleus, if we call them a nucleon, the nucleus is called a nucleon. Okay. Students, those are the stuff we have worked towards you regarding this subatomic particle neutron. It's what we have got there. Next is how do they exist? They are within the atom. Ah, it's what we call the atomic structure or model of the atom. 
Okay, so it's what we are going to find out in our next video. Okay, these are very simple stuff. Some sort of historical information. That means in history you find these information. Okay, but we need to know how work was found out and on which basis what were the experiments carried out if we do not know any such information but about their present conditions, the uh, properties and their charges and biases currently they are having, not knowing how were they discovered, then it's quite uh, empty. It's quite halfway. We know these things. Okay. Hope uh, those uh, small or short informations are enough for you to understand what kind of particles these are and how do those exist within an atom. Students, if you are going to walk up here in this video, it's hoping to meet you in our next video. We are going to say goodbye.